Hey everybody, the gang is all here. I'm back in New York. Eric is somewhat recovered, and Sean has been here all along. Uh, it's M and M and M across the board. Welcome back, Eric. How you feeling? We're getting there. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome back as well. And Sean, nice uh, job, especially uh, flying solo at the end last week. Great guest. Yeah, yeah. A little different. I can't believe you took a week off to go golfing in Myrtle Beach, but that's you. That's your decision. <laughs> he wishes he took a week I off. I wish. Be high and dry like that. <laughs> uh, guys, we got some breaking news in the NFL, which we're going to touch on and go back through last week's set of games. We're also going to do something a little different this week, which I'm excited about. Eric's going to tackle the topic of blowout losses he will expand a little bit on that and we're going to go through our top choices for play-by-play -play. current past as as sean likes to say there are no rules so we're we would be happy for you to weigh in afterwards and we can bring those comments up next week um because i think we're going to do a little more next week with analysts so we will get into all of that you can find us on apple youtube spotify twitter at mmmatb1 but let's start in the NFL, guys, where COVID has reared its ugly head. Sean is not upset about it because the Cleveland Browns are probably going to play without half their team. That's not my problem. No, I know. Their coach has tested positive now. Really? Baker Mayfield has tested positive. One of like 10 players at this point. I didn't know and either of those two. Yeah. All those right. Those are today. Those were today. And uh, as you know, most of them are vaccinated. I think all of them are vaccinated, actually. And Stefanski tested positive last year, had to sit out their playoff game, if you remember that. So this is time two for him, uh, yeah. and he's Rules vaccinated. But you can do, because they're vaccinated, you can do two negative tests within 24 hours. My thought is just if you're testing positive today, you're probably not going to test negative twice within 24 hours before Sunday. But we'll, well see. I'll tell you what, if, if they cancel the game, I'll take a stress-free win. All right? There's no apologies. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm it. sure you will. I'll the way your Raiders are going, you need a stress-free win. You're right. I'll take it. I'll take a, a, you know, it's Christmas cookie day at the Martin compound on Saturday. So I'll just focus on that and, uh, and not worry too much about the football game. Well, we got to say hats off to the Rams. Okay. Yeah. As we were watching into that game, I thought they were going to be cooked. Uh, you know, you're talking about right before the game, you find out guy game decisions. You're not going to have Ramsey playing. Uh, I thought that, Coach handled it extremely well, but for Stafford to step up like that, it was the biggest game of the year for them. It was on the road. Uh, they had to win to keep pace, and actually it was the biggest win for everybody else, uh, bringing the cards back a bit and getting them closer. But really hats off on the Rams because they were really facing a lot of adversity, and they had to come through, and uh, not just Stafford, but all of them with, with what was happening. I think the busiest person on the sideline was Lisa Salters trying to keep everybody yeah. up. Basically, yeah. Here, yeah. Here, here's my problem with the Rams. As usual, anything in this world, how does it affect Sean Martin? I had a big lead in my quarterfinal fantasy football game in the Godzilla Media League, and my opponent had Stafford and Cooper Cup, and I got caught at the wire. I'm like, just tackle Cooper Cup, please, please, please. Didn't happen, so I got eliminated. So I was a big Arizona fan that night of their Aww. defense, and they let me down hard. Well, we don't feel that bad for you. That's okay. Uh, guys, I, I mentioned this last week to Sean, and I was so unsure of the AFC North, and I'm still more unsure of the AFC North because you get the Ravens losing to the Browns. Granted, it was without Lamar Jackson for at least half of that game, but that – that conference is, or that division is such a log jam. And every week I have no idea if the Bengals are going to come out and lay an egg, if the Browns are going to come out and win, if the Ravens are going to come out and be themselves, the Steelers still aren't dead. Like the Steelers can make a lot of noise this week with a big game. Who knows? I, last week I picked, <coughs> excuse me, the Bengals to win the division. Mm -hmm. And in the NFC, the 49ers to miss the playoffs, largely thinking the Bengals were going to beat San Francisco at home on Sunday. Great game. Didn't happen. So now everything is totally scrambled. I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody wants that division. I don't know what the extent of Jackson's injury. I think he's going to play this week. But, Sounds like he is, yeah. Um, even still, they got a tough matchup with Green Bay coming to town. So I still think it's going to be the Bengals. But, you know, there are the Browns right back in it. See if they can find life in Pittsburgh with their 84-year-old quarterback. Um, just kind of hanging in there. 
I mean, the Ravens have 17 players in IR, 17 players on injured reserve. We're not even talking about the COVID situation with that team. They're the ones that should win it, and yet it's remarkable that they're still out there. We talked earlier in the year about the injuries of the running back, but now everybody's hurt. When a, when a coach has to go for a two-point play because he's got down to his seventh guy in the depth chart and doesn't trust the secondary in overtime, that's a tough situation. So the Ravens, it, it doesn't get any easier from them. I think that I, I have no idea what to expect from the Bengals, but I, I still, as you know, I've been a fan of Jamar Chase. I picked him up early in the year. The kid is going to have 1,000 receiving yards, 10 TD grabs. But you're right, Ashley, this division is crazy. Pittsburgh should be gone by now, and they're not. They come through with a win. Cleveland should be gone, and they're not. Uh, this division could have just the champ make the playoffs because they're all beating up each other. Somebody's got to lose if somebody's going to win. Yeah, and this week, listen, the Steelers have the Titans, which if the Steelers come out and win that game, people are going to go, whoop. The Broncos against the Bengals, and the Ravens get the Packers. So those are all huge games for all three of those teams and games they could all win and games they could all lose. So that division, I mean, a lot could be decided and nothing could be decided in that division after this week. Yeah, don't forget the Browns. They're they're right there. They're a game out, and they yep. get a Raider team that showed no heart last yep. week. And that game was over on the first play from scrimmage. I mm -hmm. took my kids to the playground. So I don't know if the Raiders can, can buck it up and head back east uh, this week and get off the deck from that because that was an ass kicking. Well, that's what happens when you uh, march your buses around a stadium and then stomp on their logo. You can only go so far before somebody's going to slap <laughs> you in the face for being a jackass. Uh, yeah. Guilty as charged. Especially when yeah. you're not that good. Oh, we're, we're the best. What's our record? Six and seven. Best six and seven team in the history of the NFL. Mm. Yeah. You know, right. Give us some credit. For yeah, in last place in our up with a, I, I think the Saints are probably better than you, but maybe not. <laughs> wow. I, I hope I don't have to get a get a fire hose with you two on this one. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about yeah. Kansas City for a minute because yeah. I know it's a brutal no. loss, but we have to mention the defensive play of Kansas City. Mm -hmm. It's not all Mahomes. During the six game, you know, streak, it's really been their defense that's been doing the job for them. And they're stepping it up at this point. It's about time because uh, looking back on the show, we've really maligned their defense. And I think yeah. it wasn't just the Raiders. Whoever they were playing defensively, they really would have done the trick as well. Solid D has helped them through this run. Well, so anytime you force five turnovers, you better win. That's just <laughs> what it comes down to. Five yeah. turnovers, you have to win the game. And uh, they won by the largest margin of victory in the history of that rivalry. So, wee, wee, wee. Just getting, just digging it in there a little bit, Sean. Someone did their homework. Yeah. Hey, can, can I throw? You know how I feel. I'm not a Kingsbury fan. You know yep. that. Uh, I still think he'll go back to the college ranks. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to throw this one at you. Okay. Uh, Kingsbury is five and thirteen in the second half of the season over his three years. Okay. So eight games, eight games, and, and then these two. So think about that, and also the fact that did they really want to? win the division you guys because it's seven and zero on the road so mm. is this a team where you go in and home and say you know we've really got to make sure that we we find a way to win at home no we don't want to be at home in the playoffs if they get it by or whatever they don't want to be at home for some reason they play better on the road i have no idea whether it's that rollout turf that they bring in that these new stadiums do but five and 13 is not a good thing when your coach doesn't have your team ready to play and in crunch time come december yeah Eric, where you, I don't think he's going back to college for two reasons. One, <clears throat> he's got a great situation there with a, with a young franchise quarterback. And two, there's no jobs left. He has a good roster. But as we said at the start, of the, there are issues there. There are some serious issues with that team in the clubhouse that we don't know about. And it's been bubbling over for quite some time. And the talent has kept it under the rug, per se. But it wouldn't surprise me if – unless they make, you know, do well in the playoffs that he might take a look. But you're right, Sean, the, the primo jobs are not there at this All point. Gone. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think the only way he leaves is if it's like a first round exit for that team. Um, right. And they lose to somebody that they really shouldn't. Otherwise, like they're set up, you know, their defense is good. Like you said, they have a franchise quarterback. You have DeAndre Hopkins, who's not in his prime per se, but he's not far out of his prime. Um I just think 
I think he stays because I think the situation is too good. You could you could potentially win a Super Bowl with that team, so why not give it a fair shot? But yeah, I I don't know. I'm not sure where he would go unless more. You know, if there's a chance that at the end of the season, more teams fire coaches. A lot of these coaches got fired early on before the playoffs even started in college football. So that's a little bit unusual. Um, but yeah, I guess he could still have some options depending on how things go. Hmm. And, and Sean, I want to ask you because Ashley, uh, wasn't around, I believe on December 12th of 1982, nope. but, uh, I bring that up because we weren't here last week about that remarkable game that new England barely threw a pass. Okay. Mm. And it brought us back to December 12th of 82. I was at Schaefer stadium in Foxborough mass freezing my hoo-hoo's off watching a game in a meat freezer. And we bring that up because that was the infamous snowplow game, 3 nothing Pats win, Miami, uh, Don Shula running on the field. There was no rule at the time about a snowplow making the uh, winning field goal. But I mentioned that because Steve Grogan in that game was 2 for 5 for 13 yards. So, Mac Jones, you're not alone. It is, there is a way to win a game with the Patriots uh, with only two completions. But, Sean, that uh, – absolutely incredible that you can find a way to win a game in those conditions no matter what team you are and i think that is all belichick and mcdaniels to 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 basically look at the conditions and mcdermott had the same conditions and look at how that game went unbelievable it's you brought up that that was always my go-to question in sports trivia when i'd want to win the snowplow game it won me a case of beer in college once on a radio show the snowplow driver the work release Mark program Henderson. guy? What was his name? Mark Henderson. Yes, it was. Four. That's some good trivia. Yes, it was. I called a tri- radio trivia thing, and they couldn't get it. Won a case mm. of beer. Put the beer on my doorstep. $2.99 a 12-pack Stegmeyer. How, how difficult is it with wind conditions like that to change your entire game plan, you two? And, uh, remarkable. I, I, it's, it's, you find something, you got a game plan for the, for the running game. You just keep at it. Yeah. I, right? I just think like rarely can you shift from, a, they do both well, they throw it well, they pass it well and they run it well, but rarely is a team going to on a whim kind of say, we are going to run the ball repeatedly 50 freaking times, shove it down your throat and be successful at it. Because at some point you think the other team is going to be like, okay, they're running the ball. <laughs> and they're and they're going to stop you, but they didn't do that. So listen, if it's working, and you don't have to throw the ball, why would you? I'll give the Bills credit the other day. They come on off that awful game <clears throat> where look when you can't stop somebody on the ground and they run every play, that challenges your manhood in football. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> then they fall behind twenty-four to three in Tampa. They they made a great rally. I thought they were going to win the game. Um, I'll give them credit for coming back, but their their season is is on the brink right they now. They got to get it figured out. Yeah, they got to get it figured trouble. out quick. Big trouble. Yeah, listen. I mean, it, I I agree. I, I I didn't think they were going to win the game, but it was like a switch flipped for that team, and all of a sudden they came alive. And yeah. yet somehow I, it's so funny. We're talking about the Patriots winning a game like that. And then the Patriots win by not playing this week because they had a bye. And then the Bills yeah, lose, right. and everybody everybody in Patriots land is super, super happy. But, yeah, I mean, the Bills have real problems, and I don't think people knew how significant they were. Um, Josh Allen is also dinged up. He's got a sprained foot. Like, if Josh Allen isn't 100% healthy, that team is going to be in a lot of trouble. As, as great as he is, the knock on him coming out of Wyoming was he wasn't accurate with the football. Mm-hmm. And even watching him play, he, he's fantastic. Yeah. But he still makes some throws that you kind of like, well, where's that going, dude? Mm-hmm. Um, it still happens, you know, and it's and, and they come in big spots. You know, don't get me wrong. He's elite. I mean, his, right. his scrambling ability, running ability is something else. If he can figure out that. That's the problem with accuracy with quarterbacks. You can't coach that sometimes. Either you have it or you don't. I know you're yeah. Bay Area guy, but we have to touch a, the 49ers, okay? Who saw that coming? Seriously. Garoppolo's not one of the best, but I've never seen a team that can be transformed by a tight end coming back, okay? And enough about Gronk. and It's it's time to give George Kittle some love because this the guy comes back. And 
absolutely Hall of Fame tight end material. First ever to have back-to-back 150-yard receiving games and TDs. And it's it's remarkable where the 49ers are because we talk about Arizona and the Rams and all that, but the 49ers are going to be that term tough out if they get in, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I think so. But it, I think that George Kittle is the best tight end in football, and I think somehow he's still underrated because people are going to take – like your big boxing, like massive tight ends who are just going to like, I don't know, like physical their way to a lot of balls. And he, he can do both, but he's undersized compared to a guy like say a Jimmy Graham, you know, at, at his prime. And and some of those other big guys are Martellus Bennett, those big guys in their prime. He's almost like a weird mix of like a, a fullback and a tight end who is just a really great pass catcher weaver like a small Wes Welker type tight end, which is strange to think about. But yeah, it, if he yeah. is part of that team, they could be a tough out if they can get in. Because still at this point, that division is so freaking log jammed. And I still yeah. think it's going to be the Cardinals and Rams who come out of it, but we'll see. Well, I think they got a good shot because if you <clears throat> you look at it, uh, they're seven and six. They're in now. Right, you got the red. We got Atlanta this week. Yeah, you got the Washington football team, the Eagles, Minnesota, Atlanta, and the Saints all at six and seven. There's nobody there of any consistency at all. Uh, so you got to like San Francisco's chance, and yeah, they're a pain. They got some nice running backs there, Elijah Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, receivers are good, so if Garoppolo can manage the games, I mean, they're not that far away from almost winning the Super Bowl. They got two home games left, Atlanta and Houston. So I, I like their chances, even if they, you know, that would put them at uh, 10 and 9. Uh, or No, I'm looking at the Falcons. But 49ers could go 9 and 9 and get in. I just, I think that's a club that, and as you said, perfectly well put, Ashley. Kittle doesn't get the attention, and I think it's partly because of where he plays, too. Uh, big matchup. We talked about the Chiefs. We didn't talk about the Chargers, but Chiefs play the Chargers this week, so the division is up for grabs. Uh, there, the Chargers are playing better. At least they did last week, but they played the Giants, so anybody plays well against the Giants. I will be interested to see what version of the Chargers we get because it feels like the Chiefs have turned the corner and are going to play well for the rest of the season. It feels like we still don't know what version of the Chargers we're going to get. If we get the Justin Herbert of last week, that game will be competitive. If we do not, that game won't be competitive. Yeah, I kind of checked out of this segment when you first brought up the Chiefs. But yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> They're tough games to watch for me because I loathe both teams so much. Um, yeah, I'd like to say I guess see the Chargers. I can't see I, I really hate the Chiefs. The Chiefs are now getting into Denver territory for my hatred level. Um, yeah, I'd like to see Herbert play well, see how he can do against that defense. Um, you know, and then you go back to the, is he going to have all his weapons? You know, you don't know. It's four days away. But, yeah, and actually, no, they're tomorrow night. Sorry about that. I forgot that was a Thursday night game. So I'd love to see the Chargers step up and win the game and see it just knock him to sit down a little bit. Yeah, and I think you mentioned um... – I mean, just in that division, we talked about the Broncos, uh, but, and I understand that it was the lions, but how cool just that moment, uh, Sean, we talked about Demarius Thomas in last week's podcast to have a moment like that. And a game like that, where they just come out and dominate from start to finish with his number on the field. They come out with 10 players to start the game, take the delay of game penalty. The lions reject the, uh, you know, they decline the penalty, just cool all around. Um, and to recognize a guy who was one of the greatest ever at the position. Did you get a sense when we when we recorded last week, the news was still fresh. Did you get a sense of how hard that hit the community out there when you were there? Yeah, I mean, not really in Colorado Springs. And so many of the people I was around were not from there. So it's not, you know, not quite the same as if I was probably in Denver um, around people who were from Denver. But um, yeah, I mean, you can tell just on the news, you know what I mean? From a news perspective, watching local TV news, and yeah. the amount of coverage it got, that it was clearly important. But that, I mean, listen, that was the top story in national news and sports. So, and What about we have the um, Jacksonville-Houston game this week? Oh, the toilet bowl. 
No, I'm uh, direct TV, baby. I'm all over that game. Uh, you miss it because Urban Meyer uh, undressing his assistant coaches and telling him of what failures they were and threatening to fire whoever the leak was. Well, maybe you shouldn't do that. You're you're the one that hired him, big guy. Yeah. You're hey, you know, that could be the first game that will never be ha have a highlight on red zone because neither team will get into the red zone. Yeah, so we'll watch not. red zone. And what's happening with that game? They're never in the red zone. Yeah. True. I do or want to throw one other thing about the Chargers, if I could, uh, yeah. that you were talking about, and that is um, I think it's going to be a one-point game shootout. Uh, mm -hmm. The last time Herbert played KC, 26 of 38, 281, and four TDs. That tells you that he will not do that again because you right. said it's, it's a so different team. Yeah, it's a very different team. Uh, what do, what are our thoughts on rookie of the year? I think someone that's sort of flown under the radar for us. We've brought up Mac Jones a lot still in the conversation. No doubt. Uh, Jamar chase. We've talked about, how about Micah Parsons guys? He's, yeah. he's quietly been like maybe the best defensive player in the league and he's a rookie. Yeah. He kind of on draft night, I was hoping he might slide down. Oh, the, He fell so yeah. far. I kept thinking someone's getting yeah, a stud. I'm like, God, they're talking about character issues. And I'm like, please, let's have some major character issues. I'd love to see him on my defense. Uh, he's a monster. He he, He's not the biggest guy. He's not the fastest guy. But he's one of the most unblockable guys. Mm -hmm. uh, he's all over the field. Uh, he, he, is there another even candidate for defensive player of the year or rookie of the year at least? And he's going to get defensive Yeah, I was going to say rookie, probably not. Maybe defensive yeah. player of the year. You always get those, the usual suspects. But yeah, he'll be on, the, he'll be on that list, though. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, the Cowboys, I mean, that game last week was so huge to kind of give them the space that they needed because had Washington won and the Cowboys lost, it really would it would have been a one-game separation. And now they've kind of created some space for themselves. They're 9-4, and four, Washington 6-7, and seven, the Eagles are 6-7. and seven. So, uh, to me, that division is probably locked up, but – We'll see. Yeah, I think so. I think so. They're still, unfortunately for them, they're still going to be looking at a four seed. Yep. You got you got a few other ten and three: Green Bay, Tampa, and Arizona, all above yeah. them. So I was going to say the Packers have locked up that division. Tampa yeah. Bay pretty much locked up that division, which they haven't won in fourteen years, which is seems crazy. But that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yep. Wow. Well, Steve Super Bowl the Bird the didn't win the division. <laughs> Doug Williams. But, yeah. I, hey. I do want to throw some love to the horsies, okay? It, it seems like the best week you're going to have in the NFL this year is when you're by, when you don't play. Talked about how the Pats moved up, okay? Colts, same boat. And we're not talking about the, the horsies in Denver, but the ones in Indiana. Great game coming up. Uh, the home of the Indy 500 has some real horsepower going on. They're winning with a margin of 18 points in their seven wins, plus 13 turnover ratio. That's really hard to do in this league. And 29 takeaways. This is a team to watch. They host New England. Statement game for the Colts. Mm -hmm. I think they got a shot in this one. And they are another team nobody wants to play in the playoffs. But, Sean, you're right. I would say they have a much better chance of getting into the playoffs than the, uh, the teams that we've talked about that are on the cusp. So I didn't even mention Jonathan Taylor when I mentioned the Colts. So I think this is their biggest game, and they are playing excellent football and they are ready to uh, take away Tennessee's division lead, I think. We shall see. We shall see. Big one Saturday night. Hey, folks, the current supply and demand challenges within the auto industry makes this a perfect time for you to get top dollar for your vehicle. Right now at Mohawk Honda, you can take advantage of the Kelly Blue Book instant cash offer. They will put cash in your hand, even if you don't buy from them, the same day. That's a pretty sweet deal especially for all those recent college grads or students in need of a new ride or some extra cash. Mohawk Honda's consistently kept their lot fully stocked of hundreds of pre-owned vehicles. Their large inventory makes shopping fun as you browse through the many makes and models to choose from, and you can also check out their full selection online. So stop in and say hi to Greg Johnson, the Assistant General Manager, Jake Hot Sauce Doyle, Luis the VIP Man Morales, or one of the many helpful sales consultants here at Mohawk Honda. There's a vast selection of Honda certified pre-owned vehicles, so now is the time to take advantage of the Kelly Blue Book instant cash offer. Mohawk Honda and Glenville, where they always go out of their way to please you. All right. Who's up? Eric? 
I call AAA because we're going to talk about blowouts. All right. <laughs> Two in particular. Oh, your blowouts. But I want to end with a smile, and I'll tell you why. So in all the years I've had in sports, I know these have happened, unfortunately, not too often, but I have been there. Talk about that a little bit. Talking about blowouts. Recently, Memphis Grizzlies, 152, Oklahoma City Thunder, 79, shattered the NBA record for largest margin of victory. 71 points topped the previous mark, 68 of Cleveland when they beat the Heat in 91. Now, Memphis was without its best player, Dave Morant. The Grizzlies made 63% of their shots without him. The Thunder had lost eight straight at the time, and they continued to play without a number of players. They didn't have Alexander, their top scorer, point guard, Giddy, et cetera. Now, this week, the Georgia Southern women's basketball team won 133 to 15 over Carver. That's a very small school in the National Christian College Athletic Association. On the court, of course, there are discrepancies, but they're still student athletes, and they must move forward through adversity. Carver has less than 40 undergraduate students enrolled with many in Bible studies, and they will have wonderful careers helping people. And just look at the mission of this school, to serve the church, the community, and the world as biblically-minded, professionally competent men and women of character. Now, I was with a men's basketball team in its first year in D1, and we went 1-27. and 27. We had mm. huge losses to B.C., San Diego, Boise State, Utah State. I continued to remind these young men that they were building a new tradition and talked up the travel, the togetherness, the camaraderie we had, supporting each other, and how you can learn from adversity that will help you later in life. So my lesson, forget the score. It happens. Just look at the people in the uniform. Look at the bigger picture. Thoughts? Yeah, I I don't disagree. First of all, the fact that they have 40 Four zero undergraduates, Less. men and women, and you're fielding a competent team of any sort. Good <laughs> for you. The fact that you even have a team, good for you. There are high schools in this area that have 600 kids who can't field a basketball team. So good for you. I, and I don't care if you get beat by a thousand. The fact that you went out there and play, I think it is a win all over the place. Sure. I love Eric. I love your mindset from back in the day, but because of, the transfer portal, and because of how things have changed, you will no longer convince kids to sit around through a 1-27 in season and pat each other on the back and really enjoy something like that because they're going to think, I can go somewhere else and I can at least be like mediocre and not be a 1-27 in team. So things have just changed so much. Um, I love your message and what you say, but the message doesn't translate. It used to translate – 20, 30 years ago, it doesn't translate anymore. Yeah, your message is right. It's about the experience when you're at that level. Uh, when you're talking college, you're talking pro sports, mm -hmm. you get your doors blown off. You got to look at yourself in the mirror individually as a team. I have no sympathy because nobody else does. Your opponents are. You know, we had, uh, you, see, you see high school scores, you know, 100 to 12 and you feel bad for the team that lost, but for the team that won, unless you're putting on like full court zone pressure defense, right? your backups, football, whatever sport, or your backups work hard all week in practice too. And they want mm -hmm. to go in and play. And it gives you a chance to work on things. And you shouldn't apologize for them working. You know, as long as you're playing your backups. As if long you're up playing 15 your to four at halftime, you better be playing your backups the whole second half. Yeah, time for a new five when yeah. the, when the, when you inbound for the third quarter. That's that's totally fair. I'm not. A, I don't believe in calling off the dogs. You know, you don't you don't want to you don't want to embarrass your opponent, but you you got to let your kids play. You know, pros might be a little different. You let up a little bit. You're gonna have to see them a couple times during the year, but still. You hear it happens in college football a lot of times. I mean, Scott Frost has had enough enough practice at Nebraska. I've seen enough halftime interviews with him saying, what are you going to say to your team? He goes, I'm going to go in and tell them. No one's feeling sorry for you. Right. And no one's coming through the door to help. So somebody better step up and tackle somebody. So that's just the reality of the sports, but that's part of it. And, you know, some schools take a payday to go play at a bigger school. Yeah. And that's, that's your role. You're getting well compensated. Come here and get your brains kicked in. 
unless you're you Albany that uh, took a payday at Boston College the other night and knocked off the ACC Eagles. Yep. Oh, so how's that? You get a nice check in your back pocket and you come on home with a W too. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised yeah, it doesn't happen more at the pro level. Uh, I know I remember a time we, we played a game, a late game at Dallas and uh, we didn't have any weather delays or anything else. Had to fly out that night, play the next night at Miami. And certain stars had to sit. You know, fans don't like it because they want to see a Jordan. They want to see LeBron or Steph play every single game. But you're going to have off nights. And the other problem in basketball is you can't take a knee. That hoop, you have a clock. You have to shoot. And if you try to shoot it out of bounds or whatever. So it's different when in football where you could take a knee or not kick the field goal or whatever. But it is surprising it doesn't happen more uh, at the pro level. As for the college level, women's basketball used to have scores like this years ago. Mm-hmm. It's great to see that it has improved. But actually, I agree with you. I bring up that story because uh, we've seen that happen. But I agree. A lot of kids will not stick it out. We see uh, locally that a kid left a program that was struggling and said, I want to come to this program because I want to play in the NSA tournament. Guess what, mm-hmm. kid? They've got eight losses. So you can't predict. I think the portal is a very dangerous thing and the loyalty disappears. Kids will go not for the big bucks, but go to get that big dance trip. Yeah. And I, I, I like the idea of a payday game because listen, there are programs who are trying to build up to be, first of all, it's a recruiting tool. Hey, we're going to go play at Kentucky. Hey, we're going to go play yeah. at Kansas. Most kids would say yes to that in a heartbeat, but it's also like, if you're going to go get your face kicked in, you might as well benefit the athletic program in some capacity. And what maybe those kids don't understand is that that money does benefit the athletic program. It allows you to take right. other trips and to go play at other schools or to host other teams and, and maybe pay them down the line. Like it allows you to take that next step and get to hopefully get to the level where some of those other high mid major <coughs> programs are like, how do you think Gonzaga got to where it, it was? It didn't yeah. happen overnight. It was a slow, a long, slow burn. Um, so I love the idea of a payday game. I would hate the idea of a payday game if I was that major conference team, because how often it doesn't happen often, but I was at Syracuse and LeMoyne came in and beat Syracuse in the dome. Like that's, that's every division one team's worst nightmare is to get beat up by a division two team or every power five teams nightmare to get beat by a mid major team or a non power five group of five team. So it's a lot of risk. I wouldn't want to do it, but I love the idea of those kids at the smaller schools getting that experience. Were, were you at that Lemoyne game? I was not. Thank you God. Not. I would have I'm been trying to think when you when you're in that situation. I've lived it with oh. you know the Huskers in recent years. You're just like, my God, we're struggling with Fordham. You know what? You get that sick feeling in your stomach yep. as a fan, mm-hmm. and you kind of what? What is the team feeling like? Hey, man, you're gonna got a cakewalk today, and next thing you know, you're in a battle. Listen, one of the worst days of my life, and I say this because I've been blessed with a really good life and whatever, so this is going to sound ridiculous, but one of the worst days of my life was when Syracuse lost to Vermont in the NCAA tournament. Like, that was a game that we should have had locked up from start to finish seed-wise. Nobody gives Vermont a chance, and they come in and give it to us. It was one of the worst days of my life. Not to mention I was at Jillian's at a a Sweet 16 birthday party. I was a freshman in college, came home on break, and who was playing at the Times Union Center in hockey regionals but Vermont? So I'm at Jillian's in all my Syracuse stuff, and these Vermont fans come walking down the street from the Times Union Center to watch this game, and I've never been so humiliated in my life, and I've never been made fun of more in my life by fans than Vermont fans made fun of me that night. I, it, was, it was awful. I would say I feel bad for you, but after the way I was treated during the football segment with the Raiders, I would say touche. Yeah, it's like PTSD, I know. <laughs> Who was a Vermont player? What, what, wasn't uh, Taylor, Taylor Coppenrath, Coppenrath. Was one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and TJ Sorrentine. Yeah. Two names I'll never forget. They, they haunt me in my nightmares. <laughs> Eric, what's the worst loss you ever saw on a, on a team that you uh, were with? 54 points. Okay. In basketball. I never had that issue with football, but again, when, when a program was moving up into D1, uh, we had talked to the kids and said, look, you're going to have some fun travel. We're playing in Hawaii. 
we're going to be, you know, in a series of Oklahoma, we're going to be up in the Northeast, et cetera. It was about, Ashley said, the money that comes in that goes back to the program. And so what we did is we got checks galore, but these were Division II student athletes, and there's no way around it. And the coach was also a Division II coach that had not had any time in D1. So it took about three and a half years, and I think six years later, they won the conference. But hmm, that loss was devastating. Quick. It was absolutely devastating. That one in particular was not against a team that was ranked. It was a mid-major, as we say. And so that was ugly. Uh, I will say, uh, as an assistant at a school, we played UConn when Calhoun uh, had just got things going, and we trailed 22 to nothing. And that's when the ESPN ticker started. And people were saying, why is there a game of this school against UConn in football at this time of the year? It wasn't. That was the worst game, but I actually will share that I was the mascot for that game. Ah. I actually dressed in a kitty outfit, and it was a lot of fun. People were throwing things at me, but it was oh. something I'd always wanted to do. And I, my boss said, you know what? You had the best seat in the house for us. You were covered. Yeah, you're right. You cover your face. What, what those coach. trips also give you, those trips also could be a recruiting tool because it mm -hmm. gives you a little name recognition yeah. out there. And you might yeah. you might gold mine somebody that, that remembers your name or, or something like that. And that's kind of part of the whole deal. It's about exposure. The coach yeah, like, Sean, put that to bed. The coach went over, called timeout, another timeout. He was out of timeouts, first half. Coach went over to Calhoun, pulled a ten dollar bill out, said, Can I buy you a 30 second timeout? Never forget that. I love it. That, but that's what sports is all about. At some point, it just has to be like, well, you know, um, I, I think it's so rare. I can't remember the last time I saw a score like that OKC Memphis game ever in the NBA. I, I, in my whole life, I don't remember a score like that. So I feel like it happens much more at the college level when you get those disparities than it does at the pro level. And I know there are some bad pro teams, but like 152 points. Who is giving up 152 points no to not team. even close to the best team in the NBA? Uh, it, there, yeah. You rarely see scores like that. And it, I think pretty often when you see like a 25-point margin, you're like, ooh, they got their tails kicked last night. Well, That team got beat by you, 70. Both 70 of you points? cover high school sports too. Mm -hmm. And in high school, you can see it in softball and particularly yep. baseball, okay, mm -hmm. and in lower college levels. There's no clock. You've got to record outs. Right. The innings need three outs. And you have pitchers that just can't throw it over the plate. I'm not going yeah. little league here, but you both see the high school level. And I, I've worked baseball games with double headers uh, Saturday, Sunday, back to back. The 10 hour day because nobody can throw a strike. Nobody can get an out. That That's the mercy rule. Oh, here, right? I say, thankfully, there's a mercy rule. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it is good. When you're on deadline for everyone, <laughs> including the team that's winning and the team that's, and it's just so hard in, and like you said, if you're not throwing strikes, it's not like the, the winning team can just stand up there and let you throw three down the middle and be like, okay, I'm good. I'll go take my seat on the bench. Like baseball is tough. Like you got to swing. And if you're that it's one of the tougher sports, you can't just like give up and run the clock out in soccer, like just kick the ball around instead of trying right. to score anymore. Um, yeah. That's a tough sport. Yeah. Hey, folks, just a reminder, you can find us on Twitter at MMMATV1, YouTube, Apple, Spotify for our podcast. Episode 21, by the way, we are of legal age today. All right. I'm going to have a drink after this episode. Party. I was going to drink during. I'm off today. I forgot, so. forgot to go to the store. The final few weeks of 2020, we're one of you one are here, and that means the holidays are approaching. Make sure your home is safe and warm this season, thanks to John Stone Supply in Troy. Hey, the Goodman Furnaces are now in stock. Goodman Furnaces are not only made in America, but they're also the perfect blend of efficiency and dependability for wherever you may live. Don't forget to clean out your air filters before your friends and family visit this season. Find out ways to purify the air in your home and to adjust your air filters before the big holiday events by contacting Johnstone Supply in Troy. Visit them on 6th Avenue in Troy from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. or call them at 518-272-5922. Whether it's George, Tom, Kev, or James, the crew there will offer you the best recommendations for this season. Call them today to get the best advice on how to prepare your home for the snow and to change your boilers or furnace 
Call Johnstown Supply and Troy, 518-272-5922, or leave them a comment on facebook.com backslash Johnstone Supply, Troy, New York. All right, guys, I'm infinitely interested in this segment because yeah. I'm sure we will have very different opinions. Um, yeah, 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 here we go. Here, Eric's <laughs> ready to call the game. So, uh, yeah, I'm just very interested to see where this goes. So what makes a good play-by-play -play announcer? Okay, for me, too much talking is a bad thing. Correct. Okay, I like the guys to let the moment happen and know mm -hmm. when to not talk. Capturing the moment, it comes up with iconic lines that just live forever, especially with you two. So I was thinking, who are my favorite play-by-play -play guys of all time, and who are my least favorite? Mm. Oh, least right. favorite. That's exciting. Well, the thing about the least favorite is this. Through no fault of someone's own, they might just have a voice that absolutely grates Drives them. you crazy. I just yeah. can't stand it. Yeah. You know, I, it's the same look my wife gives me when she hears me talking too long. And thank God this show is only an hour a week. So for me, the best play-by-play -play of all time, Keith Jackson, Mr. College Football, great on baseball, great on anything he did, just unbelievable. I, I wish he was still with us. He gave you a reason to watch the Rose Bowl every year. Oh, Nelly. Oh, Nelly. Number two, Vin Scully. Loved him until he just retired with the Dodgers. They, they were must-see TV for me just to hear his voice, his call of the 86. Sorry, Eric. World Series when the ball got by Bill Buckner. Ray and I came around to score the Mets won it. <laughs> it was fantastic. And when I say about the guys who, who know when to not talk, Pat Summerall was a master at that mm -hmm. with John Madden. He would he would give you a five cent five word sentence and capture it'd be worth a thousand words with the video and uh, and everything going on. Uh Ashley, you're you're probably too young to remember him, but Kirk Gowdy. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, an old fisherman. Is he fisherman, your number four? Is this what? He's number four, Kirk Gowdy. He was a big NFL guy. I used to see him a lot uh, with the Oakland Raiders of the 70s. Used to always see him cover those games. He was on the Super Bowl every other year. Okay. Number five, recently retired. The greatest NHL play-by-play -play guy ever was Dan Kelly. It was a long, long time ago. Doc Ooh. Emmerich. Could yeah. just love yeah. to listen to Doc Emmerich's voice and just his knowledge of the game mm -hmm. and his verbiage was Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Now, also, I'm going to throw in just an also considered Marv Albert, Bob Costas, Al Michaels on the Do You Believe in Miracles? Uh, the greatest, one of the greatest teams ever, Howard Cosell and Frank Gibbard on Monday Night Football. And like I just said, Dan Kelly on the NHL back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'll get to my worst after, but I'll, uh, I'll punt it to you guys to see what your uh, thoughts are. Well, baseball, I agree. I When I lived in California, listening to Vince Scully in the beach, I felt I was watching Van Gogh paint. He did the games alone. You don't need another voice. All The yeah. only other sound I want to hear is a hot dog vendor and a bat hitting a ball. He, he, remarkable. Uh, basketball, I would say Chick Hearn, who was the longtime Lakers announcer. Tremendous announcer. Is fortunate to meet him much later in his career, but just absolute professional in an area where they don't seem to care about it as much as they do in the East, but Time unbelievable. Out. Time yeah. out. This Big fan just picked Chick Hearn. Yes, I did. I'm unbiased. being objective. He's a very unbiased fan. I don't know what yes. that term means. Actually. He ta I know clearly. He takes his his job here very seriously and uh, is well, trying to be fair and balanced. We'll touch on the worst when you do. Uh, best football to me, I agree with you, Keith Jackson with the fumble. Uh, he spoke at our convention, and that's how he talked. We actually have a Keith Jackson Award that is presented to the media. First class college football. He did the baseball, but it's all about the, the pigskin. Hockey, no question. I agree with you on that too, Doc Emmerich. Everybody loved how he would always throw in from this town in Canada or from this college. Uh, they don't come any better. And it all started with the Maine Mariners. And I will throw two utility guys at you, mm -hmm. Dick Enberg and Jim Nance. Love and when Enberg. I say utility, because they can do it on the court, they're clear and concise. They can do it on the gridiron. They can do it on the green. They can do it in the studio. Uh, you know, Dick Enberg, uh, absolute amazing. And of course, Wimbledon. People don't forget that. They think we're mm. football, yeah. but I would say Jim Nance is right there with Dick Enberg for utility, as for the best. Uh, Ashley, go ahead. I like that. Um, okay. I will start. So uh, this is why I think this is interesting because I don't have uh, the 
memories of so many of the guys that you just named because I wasn't alive or watching sports at that time. So my number one is one of the few that was left from like the old timey feel. My number one is Doc Emmerich because he's for me nowadays, it's just different than it was back then. And Doc is a throwback to the time when things were still like that classic feel. And I think he just has, he had a way to paint a picture of a hockey game. His voice was great. I love it. My biggest pet peeve is someone who changes their voice. So someone who does not talk like that, it, it, I hate it in television as well for the job that I do. I hate when people change their voice and like really put it on, like just be you, just be who you are and talk like a normal human being. So What's Emmerich it? is one for me. Brent Musburger is another, a little bit of a throwback, uh, college football, loved listening to him, just like makes you feel at home when he's in your living room. You, do you know he's the Raider play-by-play guy? Oh, he yeah. is. Oh, he's been for a few years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, lucky Early. you. Early yeah. 80s. I love Brent. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, this is probably the most controversial one. And I. Th- it's funny because people, whenever this person's name, I'm going to make you guess. Whenever this guy's name comes up, people either love him or they hate him. Joe Buck. Joe Buck. Correct. Exactly. I love Joe Buck. I love his voice. Ooh. I think he's fan. He, my, I love when he does baseball. I think he's fantastic, but he does a good job at football. I I don't quite understand like the hatred. It's like a venomous hatred that some people have for him, but I love Joe Buck. How do you both of you feel about him? I, I like his voice. I like his knowledge. I don't like his arrogance. Okay. That's my problem with Joe Buck. Okay. Who's on my worst list, by the way. I mean, he's got the lineage. That's for sure. I don't like the fact that on uh, Celebrity Family Feud that his wife and three daughters told him to give an answer, and he went up and didn't give the answer and embarrassed his whole family. Aww. That's Joe Buck. He did. Sorry, <laughs> that sealed the deal. But I, okay. I see what you're saying, Ashley. But I'm, I'm not a tremendous fan. But Fox is, and they matter more than we do. Sure. Here. Well, I didn't yeah. know that story. I'm not sure it yeah. would have <laughs> made me feel differently about his play-by-play skills. But yeah. Yeah. I understand when you don't really so- love. So like here's that. my worst, and I have some people, you know, passed on, older guys, older people. Um, but I, it was hard coming up with this list because if they were really bad, most likely they're not still on TV. Hang on. Can I give you my my two more? I got Yeah, it. I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Go ahead. So Nance is four for me. I love everything he does. He just is very, you know, again, calming voice. And I it, for five, I put in an up-and-comer who I love. He's a Syracuse guy. Jason Benetti is my like youthful up and comer. He's a white Sox play-by-play guy, super mm-hmm. talented, yeah. does college basketball. He, the guy can do anything. So he's my guy of the future. Good one more shout out. Go ahead. The yeah. Former Red Sox, current Padre Don Orsillo is fantastic too. Yes. All right. So the worst, here's yep. my worst five. Again, a lot of the bad ones Ooh, aren't in five. the, in That's the any. profession anymore. So I had to dig a little number five, Jack Buck. I couldn't Ooh, stand him. God, you don't like Joe. You don't no. like Jack. This is terrible. No, I couldn't stand Jack. But he had one good call when when uh, Kirby Puckett won Game Six of the '91 World Series when he said, "We'll see you tomorrow night." That was great. The others, uh, I just couldn't stand him. Number four, let's keep it in the family. Joe Buck, the aforementioned <laughs> reasons. Number three is Mike Tirico. Yeah. I just can't stand his voice. Oh, oh my God. He's okay on golf. Some yeah. guys are good on some stuff. I don't like him in the NFL. It's it's no. I just yeah. ugh, I can't stand it. Number two is one of the most popular play-by-play guys in the country right now. Kevin Harlan. Oh, uh, you know what? Oh, His, he bothers me a little bit too because yeah. I feel like he puts it on. He's got that voice going. Yes. The yeah, voice. I feel. So much. I would be happy to meet him and be like, "Hey, what do you really talk like?" But I feel like he—it's a little thick for me. <laughs> yeah, it is, and not every play is the greatest play in the history. Of Correct. Sports. So, like, okay. ah! exactly. Yeah. And number one, and there, there is no. I mean, you got number one up here and two, and we're regional. And if if you haven't listened to him, don't. John Michael Sterling, K. Susan Waldman for the oh. New York Yankee Radio. I thought you were going to say Michael K., but. Yeah. Uh, you could throw him in there. I was actually going to say anybody to do with the Yankees, the TV, and the radio. That's not true. Ryan Rucco's a star. I don't know anything about him. Sterling and Waldman are just unlistenable. I used to be working. 
I'd want to listen to a radio a game in the radio. I got TV in my office now, thank you. <laughs> I used to want to watch game in the listen to a game in the radio and hear the Yankee announcers come on. I'm like, I can't listen to this game. Listen, I will raise you Sterling and, and Waldman, and, and you're going to hate this. But the first time I ever heard Vin Scully call a game, I thought to myself, <laughs> oh, my God, what the hell am I listening to? Because the first time I ever heard him call a game was probably like two or three years ago. He was already ancient. He was calling a game by himself. He was telling himself stories, talking to himself. And I just thought to myself, call the damn game. What What is everyone so excited about for this you Vince were, Scully guy? You were because I had never, you know, he's, he's on the West Coast. I had never really heard him call games before. So that to me, your Susan... And Sterling, that yeah. that to me is Vince Scully. I just can't get into it. I couldn't get into it. But he was probably 88 years old. I know, but it. that's what I'm saying. Sterling is 80-something years old. Let me let me tell you, when for somebody that did it in college and then worked at colleges, calling baseball by yourself is the most difficult thing in oh, broadcasting. No doubt. I had two games at the University of Hawaii with rain delays, okay? No. And I'm solo calling the game. You've got to do a ton of homework. You've yeah. got to have a lot of stories. That doesn't mean that the story misses strike three. You work it in. Right. And you, right. Baseball, though, also you know when to breathe. You don't mm -hmm. have to talk like hockey every single second. So mm -hmm. baseball, to me, the iconic Hall of Fame announcers need those stories that their real fans want to hear, but they also need to know when to not talk. And Buck right. has improved with that like Sean McDonough did in a walk-off homer when he did CBS in the series. I love but McDonough. Very difficult to do. Love yep. McDonough. Yeah. I'll give you my worst by sport all time. Baseball, Ken Harrelson. Okay. Come on, Paulie. We kiss another one. Goodbye. I don't mind the goodbye call, but I'm tired of the wee, wee, wee. Okay. Don't want to hear that. Come on, Paulie. Why don't you go in the dugout and pat him on the back? Okay. Basketball. Uh, I'm not a homer. Johnny Most of the Celtics. He had a very gravelly old voice, big time homer, famous for a game in the playoffs against the Pistons when he says, Hey, Mall Bird, Lambert should be put in jail, put in prison. Good. That is not the way that you teach kids how to broadcast, but his mic did get uh, uh, honored and rise to the rafters. Football, I'm sorry, Buck, we've talked enough about that. Mm -hmm. And hockey. Recently retired, an icon in Pittsburgh. His name is Mike Lang. Okay, Pittsburgh loved him. But just watch his highlights, folks. You'll hear, slap me silly, Sydney. And, and one, another one was, he just oh, lost his liquor license. What the hell are you talking about? And my, my two favorite, save my face with a rusty razor. And the pens are smiling like a butcher's dog. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. But he's an I icon. Penguin, but I liked him. Oh, my God. Absolute wacko. But Pittsburgh yeah. loved him, just like St. Louis in the Midwest grew up with Jack Buck, and they loved him. I can't. Uh, I, yeah, I've you given you, I gave you my Vince Scully story. I do not feel like I can go out and just hack job someone in my profession because I am about to go do sidelines for a team, and it just feels wrong. Uh, so I'm sure. not going to give you my least favorites. I, d I don't love Vin Scully like everyone else does. Um, I'm a Yankee homer and I don't love the Yankees broadcasters, but that's as much as I'll say there. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to destroy anyone and their career and confidence and not that they need, not that I'm going to destroy any confidence. Oh, by the way, it's you're, like you're it gonna, would bring me some bad juju. You're going to do awesome for the Firewolves. Well, thank you. All right. Are we ready? That was a fun topic. one. Next week, we're going to do uh, analysts. Analysts. All right, perfect. I love it. Yeah, Boomer Esiason, you're on notice, pal. Ooh. All right, it's time. It's time. The whiteboard. Who wants to go first? Why don't we have the Kansas Jayhawk go first? All right, Kansas Jayhawk. Yeah, let's get that back yeah, on. Lift it up. Take your uh, announcer hat off. <laughs> Bob Dole. I'm not Norm McDonald. He did a great Bob Dole. May he rest in peace. Now, when I was young, I was with my grandmother in an event, and we were fortunate to meet the senator from Kansas, Robert Dole. He's a war hero, an American who didn't care about political parties. He passed away last week. He greeted me by saying, hello, young man, Bob Dole here. It reminds me now of Ricky Henderson. 
that first person thing that they do, you know, where Ricky said, Ricky says, thank you for the tickets. Tell Ricky, I like you too. Now I saw the Senator speak at our sports PR convention many years later. What's the sports connection with him? Many people don't hear about this, but he was recruited at Kansas by the legendary Fog Allen. Okay. Mm. Absolute legend in Kansas. He played basketball, football, and track before heading off to war. So today, I want to pay tribute to a person who survived a difficult battle, served their country, and greeted you, and listened to you, and gave you the honor of being in his presence. Rest in peace, and thanks for your service, Senator Bob Dole. Yeah, political parties aside, loved the guy. Um, the, all the pictures I've seen, and I have very good friends who have met him when they went down to Washington at the war memorials because he would sit outside there and greet fellow veterans and welcome them to the memorial and talk to other people who weren't veterans who were bringing people. So just like, you know, that's the type of guy who you want representing your country at any level. Um, and someone who, again, gave, gave time to the military. So yes, absolutely well-deserved and may he rest in peace, but just top, top flight American in my book. Mm. All right, Ashley, you or me? Me next. Go for it. I'll go, sure. Oh, oh. Steph, the new king of the three in the NBA. Really cool moment. This was last night um, as we tape on a Wednesday here. Really cool moment. Steph Curry, a guy who has quite literally transformed the game of basketball, passes Ray Allen for number one all-time on the NBA's three-point list. With number 2,974, he ended up after last night with 2,978. But listen, that was a who's who. It cost you like an arm and a leg to get into the nosebleeds of MSG last night to watch Steph, who only needed two threes, so you knew he would get it. Who's who? Dell was there. Both of his parents were there. He gives the ball to Dell. Ray Allen flew in. Reggie Miller was calling the game. Just a really, really cool moment. They call timeout. He gets uh, the cheers from the crowd. And he is going to set a record that is absolutely, uh, I'm going to say unattainable. I don't know how long someone like a Trey Young will play in the NBA and how many threes he will hit. I feel like he's going to, to set a record that is absolutely unattainable. And I think people probably thought that about Ray Allen's record at the time. But if this guy plays for five, six more years, I mean, it's going to be absurd. So good for him. And like I said, I think even with LeBron, I think that Steph Curry is the most transformative basketball player since Michael Jordan. He is I the agree. reason everyone <coughs> shoots a three, whether it's bigs, smalls, it doesn't matter. He's the reason every kid shoots a three from half court in his driveway. The yeah. most transformative player since Jordan. He's extended the court. That's mm -hmm. clogged up by bigger, stronger, faster athletes. He's, he's, you have to defend more of the court now because he'll he'll drain it from the logo. Yeah. Uh, All-time Warriors team. This is a franchise that started in Philadelphia, okay? This is one of the iconic length franchise. They didn't have a hell of a lot of success over the years, but he created a dynasty. Yes, KD had a part of it and these other guys are the perfect coach. But to me, all-time Warriors team is Wilt. It's Rick Barry, it's Nate Thurman, it's Chris Mullen, and it's Steph. He's a class act, tremendous record, tremendous service in a community, Oakland, that truly, as Sean knows, needs that community service and somebody they can grasp to and relate to. He's done pretty well, folks, since the day he was drafted when the analyst said, ah, Davidson, yeah, he's, his father was a pretty good player. He's a pretty good shooter. He might have a good career. Yeah, he's had a good career. Drafted yeah. after Johnny Flynn from Syracuse to the team. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Ashley. You you started with me. That was a big bust. Yeah. Listen, Before, I love Johnny. He did some good things for me in Syracuse. So I don't care about his pro career. He's a good player. Before I get to my whiteboard, I had received feedback from our show two weeks ago. A very dear friend of mine is a huge Seattle Seahawks fan. Um, and her husband told me when she was listening to my words on Russell Wilson, her jaw was open. Oh, um, no, I don't know if I can repeat the words that might have come out that I can envision. Um, not happy, so he in basically the immortal, said he was no good, overrated, not no good. Uh, pretty much, no. I mean, <laughs> we gave him love, we did, overrated. we did, yes. Eric and I gave him some love. She doesn't know you though, she knows. 
she knows the guy delivering the honest. Well, if she knows you, she should know you are not going to give love to anyone other than your teams. You're right. (laughs) You're right. So I'm just to respond in the words of Pee Wee Herman from the Cheech and Chong film in 1981, Night Dream. I'm not sorry. (laughs) Anyway, to the whiteboard, hashtag hot dog with mustard. Y'all know who Mike Leg is? Mm-hmm. Mike Leg is the young man for the University of Michigan hockey in 2016, I believe, against Minnesota. Had the time and the wherewithal behind the net to reach down very skillfully, dip his blade of his hockey stick, pick up the puck, hold on to it, wrap it around the net for a goal, which has become the fashion thing to do in hockey now. It happened with the Anaheim Ducks last week. And and that's awesome, and it's cool, and it's creative. John Tortorella, now of ESPN, took a lot of heat this week for criticizing the move, saying it's just not the way he likes hockey being played. I don't think I've ever agreed with Torts on anything. I don't think there's anything wrong with the play. I don't like it. To me, that's not hockey. But if you're going to do it, one of these times very soon, you put your head down and you think you got space, you're going to get freight trained by an opponent. All right, you're going to go into those backboards and they're going to make the example out of you because that's hot dog. Okay. And that's, that's not a sport that usually has that. So do your Michigan move. That's how good the move was. It's called the Michigan. That's yeah. how, you know, yeah. it, it's phenomenal. And it takes a lot of skill. That's something you do in a skills competition, an all-star game, maybe not an NHL game. And somebody is going to get drilled by doing it. Well, if I yeah. coach a de- defenseman, uh, yeah. I want to know how the hell the kid had that much time to do that behind the net okay if i'm a goaler i coach a defenseman why is he open and able to do that it is yeah. a difficult play and it is legal because it's shot under the pads i'm not a fan of it either but uh it, that goes back on the defense and if i'm a goalie i would plaster the kid behind the net well, if, if i'm a coach you may not get the guy after the goal and then save yourself a penalty but you may get him later in the game yes, um, you, right. to me you're showing up your opponent when you do that i, I might be old school too much on that uh, not a big fan. Although the kid Mannheim scooped the puck over the net off of the Saber goalie and into it, so it was a very creative. Um, but you got to have your head on a swivel if you're going to do yeah. those things. Listen, I think probably when Leg did it in 1996, it was not a hot dog move. It was probably like, listen, I think I can do this. Like I think I can yeah. just sneak it in behind him. Since then, it's become. A little bit of a hot dog move to me. It feels very lacrosse. I've watched a lot. I've yeah. watched a lot of lacrosse these days, and it's you know Gary Gate over the back, uh, air gate trying to you know scoop it in or from around the backside. It feels very lacrosse. It's going to sound weird, but when you see it, it feels like a travel. Like it feels like a travel in basketball. <laughs> like you're picking it up and you're carrying it, and it almost feels like it shouldn't be allowed. But I, I'm not going to take that away from anybody. Like, you want to try it? You want to get beat up by the defense? Have at it. I always say, if you don't want them to do it, then stop the damn puck. Stop, stop the right. puck from going in the goal if you don't want them to do it. So I, I have no with problem with it. Yeah. It feels weird, but have at it. I agree with what you're saying. I don't like yeah. it, but I agree with it. Because, yeah, if you're going to have the time, they're going to lay off you. Thank you for correcting me. I think I said 2016, the goal yeah. was 96. Um yeah, but be prepared to pay the price. So yeah. don't whine if you get if you get your, your clock cleaned yeah. after yeah. doing that move. I That's enjoy it. that you uh, used hashtag hot dog with mustard because I will tell you, I went through the Chicago airport uh, on my way back from Colorado Springs, and what did I get? A hot dog with mustard. Wow. wow. All things That's come Chicago full circle. Chicago hot dog. Thank you very much as we're taping this during lunch. Really appreciate that. I know I'm starving. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get the heck out of here. It's been fun. Right. Week 21, I'm going drinking. Absolutely. I'm going raging here. It's Absolutely. my day off, so I can have a beer with my hot dog at lunchtime. Little Guys, it's drinking. been fun. We'll do it again next week, Christmas week. So we'll see you then one more time before the holiday. All righty. Have a great week. See ya.